<laughs> I'm only a little nervous. No, I'm, I'm very nervous. <laughs> um, it's so sad. I'm the last presenter. I feel so sad at the end of conferences because I have such a good time watching all the talks and now I'm the last talk. But fortunately, I am on stage, so I don't get to enjoy my talk. <laughs> You all get to enjoy my talk. Uh, so I, let's, I guess we should get this started. Um, I'm giving a talk called Exploring Memory in Ruby or Building a Compacting Garbage Collector. Uh, my name is Aaron Patterson. Uh, my nickname on most websites, if you don't know already, is Tender Love. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, if you don't recognize me in person, you might recognize my icon, which is this. Um, I used to have much longer hair, and it wasn't so gray. <laughs> Just kidding, it's a wig. So I'm on the Ruby core team and the Rails core team, so if you want to talk to me about any Ruby stuff or Rails stuff, I'll talk to you about either one of those. I love Ruby, and I also love Rails, so I will tell you anything you want to know about any of those. It, well, if I know the thing. If I don't, I'll tell you what to Google for. Uh, I work for a a small startup company called um, GitHub. Uh, <laughs> we're an online code hosting website, <laughs> if you haven't heard of us. Um, anyway, I like, to use, I like to use Git at work. I really enjoy using Git, but I will not um, force push it on you. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have two cats. Uh, and they like to help me write code. This is one of them. This is uh, Gorbachev Puff Puff Thunder Horse. Uh, he's the one on the right. Um, <laughs> this is my other. This is my other cat, Choo Choo. Her full name is SeaTac Airport Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, so I noticed that a lot of people at the first. Uh, on the first day, quoted me a lot, so I decided to quote myself, which is that I love my cats. Uh, I also like selfies, um, so please come take selfies with me. And in fact, um, I recently started doing double selfies, which if you do <laughs> Yes, Jimmy, I'm talking about you. Uh, <laughs> I recently d started doing double selfies, and you might be wondering, what is that? And that's, well, it's when two people with two selfie sticks take selfies of each other, and this is something that Jimmy and I have been doing. This is us at uh, Red Dot <laughs> Ruby Conference, and this is us again here at uh, Ruby Kaigi. <laughs> so uh, I want to tell all of you, like, please, please come say hello to me. Um, after this talk, at the uh, after party tonight, anytime, please come talk to me. I know, like, some people have told me, Aaron, you're famous. I'm afraid to talk to you. Please, but don't be. I will not bite. I like to talk about programming or anything. If you don't know what to say to me, uh, I do have stickers. <laughs> These are, they are stickers of my cat. <laughs> so I will give you a sticker of my cat. <laughs> um, or if you want to take a selfie, we can do that too. Uh, so I just want to say thank you. Thank you to the organizers. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you to all of you for coming to this conference. I'm really happy to be here. Uh, it's so good to see uh, <laughs> where the magic happens. <laughs> I also enjoyed, uh, Tim pointed this out to me, that apparently the people here are really into security, especially cyber security. <laughs> oh, it makes me laugh. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about, today we're going to talk about a mark and compact garbage collector. Uh, this is something that I've been working on at work uh, when I have time to do it. Uh, this has interested me for a long time because um, a compacting garbage collector can help us reduce uh, fragmentation and memory usage in our programs. Uh, and one of the things that I want to focus on is talking about copy and write optimizations that we can get from a compacting garbage collector. So we're going to talk a little bit about GC and memory in Ruby. Uh, so we're going to have three different topics today. We'll talk about um, copy and write optimizations, uh, next, we'll talk about building a compacting GC and MRI. And then we're going to talk a little bit about memory inspection tools in Ruby as well. 
Um, this talk is a bit of a low level talk, uh, but I want everyone here to be able to get something out of the presentation. So for new people, what I would like you to do, if there are new, new developers in the audience, is just think about, like, think about these questions as we're, as we're going through the presentation. Like, what, is, what exactly is copy on write? Um, what is compaction? And the thing that I want you to know is, like, maybe you don't understand all of the presentation, but when you're sitting at work someday and you're thinking, oh, I've, I, I've heard about this problem, or I know, I know about this problem, uh, I saw it in a presentation, I know what I can search for online, and I want you to know that you, you can solve the problem eventually. I just want you to be able to remember these things and say, well, other people have come across this, so I can, I can probably fix it too. Uh, for experienced people, uh, if you already know about these things from a high level perspective, I want you to pay attention to the algorithms and implementation details that I'll talk about. Uh, so look at the actual algorithms and the different implementation details, and maybe tonight we can talk about the downsides of the work that I have done. <laughs> uh, so first, let's talk about copy and write optimizations, or uh, as it's commonly known as uh, COW or COW, which I will refer to it as COW from now on. I enjoy that, or I may use copy and write too, but if you see this term, it's basically the same thing, just a shortening. So what is, what is this uh, optimization? And very simply what it is, is it means that uh, we don't copy something until it's been written to. So let's look at a concrete example of this optimization. We'll look at it in Ruby. Uh, so here's an example of uh, cow optimization using Ruby. You'll see here that first we create a very large string, um, a very large Ruby string, and if we take a look at the size, you can see that the initial size is over 9,000. <laughs> <laughs> yes. All right, uh, I'm wired now. Ooh, oh, I sound much better. <laughs> uh, so this one's over 9,000. Uh, and if we dupe the string, if we call dupe on the string and then we check the size, you can see that it's actually 40. The copy is size 40, so we didn't actually copy the string. We didn't copy the underlying string. It's, it's much smaller than the original. However, if we write to the string, you can see on the next line, we write to the string. If we check the size after we write, this, write to the string, you can see that now it's of size, the same size as the previous string. So we copied the string when it was written to. In other words, we had a copy on write. So this is a copy on write optimization in, in Ruby itself with just strings. Uh, and you can observe the same behavior with arrays. So the array starts out large. The dupe is small, and then when we write to the array, it gets big again. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the same behavior with hashes. If you call dupe on a hash, it'll actually copy the entire hash. So maybe we can fix this particular case, but um, I'm not sure. Uh, if you want to contribute to Ruby, maybe this is a good place to start looking. Uh, but the interesting thing about this optimization is that essentially, there is no observable difference between a copy and the original, right? If you copy something and you look at both of them, they should be exactly the same. There's no difference between the two of them. So the basis of this optimization is that we don't actually have to do that copy until one of them changes. Now, this optimization isn't limited to just Ruby and these strings. It's, you can use this anywhere you want to. Just think about this optimization when you're doing any, any type of stuff. Uh, and one place that this optimization is used frequently is within your operating system. So we use this inside of operating systems, and we use this a lot when we use the command fork. We heard a little bit about this uh, yesterday. Uh, when you fork a process, the operating system makes a copy of that process. Uh, and the operating system uses the copy and write optimization. So in this particular case, we have a parent process where we create a string. Our initial string is, again, uh, nine, over 9,000. <laughs> uh, now, when we fork the process, we make a copy of the parent process into the child process, but it doesn't actually copy anything. It just creates a new process. Now, if we write to that string down here, the operating system will actually copy it. It'll copy that string. But the operating system is a bit smarter than Ruby is. It doesn't copy the entire string. 
If we look at how the operating system actually works, it splits that string up to, into many pages. So we have, in our parent process, we, we split up memory into multiple pages, and each of those pages is about four kilobytes. Now, when the child process is created, all the child process does is point back up to the parent process. So it's just pointing at the parent process's memory. Now, when we actually write into that string, the, child the operating system copies uh, the memory from that parent process into the child, but it only copies the section that's been written to. So in this case, we, we wrote to the string and only maybe this page gets copied. So we wrote into that string there. Um, so we write into the middle of the string and one page gets copied. And in this case, when that page gets copied, that's what's called a copy on write page fault. So if you want to observe where this happens in your programs, you need to look for copy on write page faults. Uh, so in general, uh, if we want to do better with uh, cow optimizations, uh, we want to decrease the number of page faults that we have in our programs. So you may be asking, why is this so important to me? Uh, the reason this is important to me is because at work we use forking a lot. Uh, in fact, our uh, web server, we use Unicorn as our web server, and Unicorn is a forking web server, meaning that uh, it creates a parent process and then forks off many child processes, and those child processes handle requests. So we fork lots of processes at work. So this, this optimization is pretty important to me. Now, when Unicorn create, creates its uh, children pro child processes, it does something like this. Say we have a unicorn parent, it forks off many children. Uh, now, uh, let's imagine that the reason, uh, let's imagine that each of these child processes loads Rails in. Now, what that means is, unfortunately, each of these child processes would contain their own copy of Rails, and this is a bad thing. So we don't want to have this. We don't want to have Rails loaded three times into memory. Why should we waste all of that space? So in this particular case, we can take advantage of copy and write optimizations. The way we do that is we have the parent process load Rails. Then we fork off a bunch of child processes. Then those child processes now point at the parent process's copy of Rails. And we only have one copy in memory. So the advantages of this are that we reduce boot time uh, because we only have to load Rails once. We decrease memory because we're only keeping one copy in memory at a time. Now, don't freak out. This is how your application works today if you're using Unicorn. So this is one way that we use copy and write optimizations with our operating systems on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, this particular optimization isn't the one that I'm interested in, but it's one that you can use at work today. What I'm interested in doing is reducing page faults. Uh, and as I said earlier, page faults are something that happens when you write, you write to a bit of memory and then that page needs to be copied into a different process. Now what causes page faults? Uh, page faults are caused by mutating shared memory. Anytime we have a piece of shared memory and that gets mutated, we create a page fault. And the biggest offender of this particular issue of mutating shared pages is actually the garbage collector. So let's go over some different things that the garbage collector does to ruin our, ruin our day. <laughs> uh, it used to be that, unfortunately, the mark phase used to cause this, this issue. Now, when we went through and marked all the objects, that mark bit was actually stored on each object. What would happen is, in older versions of Ruby, when we would mark, a child, when we would mark an object, it would mark a bit. And unfortunately, that meant that the object had to be copied to the child process. So each one of these, as the GC went through, it would mark a bit on the object, and that object would have to get copied into the child process. And that meant that after a few GCs, the entire process was copied between the two. Um, now, unfortunately, this is even worse than it looks, because remember, the operating system copies one page at a time, so it didn't copy one object at a time. In fact, what would happen is, when we marked an object, maybe it would copy the entire page. So the whole thing would be copied, not just the objects that got marked. Now, the good news is that we introduced a technique called bitmap marking. And what this does essentially is, instead of keeping that mark bit on the object itself, we keep a table. So when the, when the GC goes to mark an object, all we do is we set a bit in a bit table that's stored off to the side. Now, that bit table does get copied between processes, but the bit table is much smaller than the rest of the memory that we have, so we save overall. 
So this is how this is how the garbage collector works today. So this is a good optimization for uh, uh, cow improvements. Now uh, another problem is object generation. Uh, the actual generation of the object. Ruby has an, a generational garbage collector. Now, what happens is, today the age of the object is stored on the, on the object itself, so every time an object survives a garbage collection, we increase the age of the object, and that age is stored on the object. And that means that we end up in a similar situation as the mark bit, mark bit phase, meaning that, well, when this object gets older, we have to write to that object and it's going to get copied to a child process. So we actually have a workaround for that. Uh, it's one that we use at work and it is called Nakayoshi Fork. Uh, and essentially the, this gem works on the following principles. The principles are that generations are bounded. That we only have a certain number of generations. So an object can only get so old before it continues to age further. Uh, once an object is considered as old, it won't get any older, essentially. So what we can do is we'll say, well, you know, if an object is created before we call fork, we're pretty sure that it's going to get old eventually. So we assume that, well, all of the code that we loaded, all the objects that we created, uh, if they survive before we do a fork, they're probably going to get old. So what we can do is we'll say, oh, OK, before you fork, let's just GC a bunch of times. We'll just run the garbage collector and then make everything old before we fork. So we just GC a bunch. Uh, and if you look at the source of the Nakayoshi, Nakayoshi fork gem, uh, it'll look a little bit like this. And you'll see here, I've simplified the code a little bit, but you can see that essentially all it's doing is it's monkey patching fork, and it says, okay, um, I'm just going to GC a bunch of times, four times, in fact, uh, and then just call the real fork. That's essentially all it does. So if you're running a forking web server in production, I recommend using this gem. Now the last thing is, in fact, object allocation. Last problem with the GC would be object allocation. And this one is kind of surprising, uh, but just allocating an object can cause memory to be copied from the parent process to the child process. So for example, we have, uh, in this case, two processes, a parent process and a child process. The child points at the parent. Uh, but we have some free space. You'll see we have some free space in these pages. Uh, and the child process may allocate an object. So we'll allocate an object there. And that means that that object has to be copied, or that section has to be copied. Uh, and maybe, uh, unfortunately, remember, the whole page gets copied, so maybe the operating system copies that entire page. So now we have this unnecessary amount of memory copied from the parent process to the child. So how can we reduce the space, or how can we, how can we reduce the amount of um, data that gets copied? And the way we do that is with a technique called uh, GC compaction. Oh. Oh, oh, what is happening to my slides? GC compaction. All right, so we're going to discuss GC compaction. So for example, let's say um, before we fork, we have two pages that look like this. And you can see we have some free space on those pages. Uh, what if we were to take those objects and move them around such that all of the free space was grouped together and all of the non-free space was grouped together? Now we fork a process, or fork a child. The child points at the parent process, and maybe we allocate some objects, right? You can see from this graph here that maybe only one page gets copied. So this, only this one page with the free space gets copied, and the other one will not. So before, in the worst case scenario, it could be that both pages get copied because both pages had free space. If we compact before we fork, then we only copy one page, so half of the memory gets copied. So let's talk about. GC compaction itself, how it works and what it is. And this is a project that I've been working on at um, GitHub and I at work. Uh, and I want to talk about how it works. So we have a fork of Ruby that has compaction built in. Uh, so what is, what is compaction? Uh, it's essentially just what I showed before. Compaction is taking the objects uh, from moving the objects around such that all of the free space is grouped together and all the non-free space is grouped together. That's it. So why would we compact? Uh, there's two main reasons for doing this. Reducing memory usage. Uh, two main reasons why I wanted to do this. The one is to reduce memory usage. And the other one is because uh, people told me that it was impossible to do. <laughs> uh, I actually talked about this. I talked about moving objects around at one or a different 
GC technique at RubyConf a year, year or so ago, and uh, I said, oh, the reason that we're going to do this optimization is because GC compaction is impossible. And unfortunately, I, had, I think I had been talking to JRuby developers too long. <laughs> they, they told me this was impossible to do. And after my presentation, Koichi came up to me and said, why is it impossible? And I said, I don't know. <laughs> People told me it's impossible, and he said, well, maybe you should try it before you say it's impossible. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I'll try it then. And it turns out it is not impossible. It is just hard. Uh, but we'll talk about how, we're going to talk about specifically how to do it with MRI uh, and how you can do it too. Uh, so since I didn't have a good answer to why this was impossible, I had to do it. Uh, so there's, there's many different compaction algorithms, and we're going to talk about the one that I chose. Uh, which is called two-finger compaction. Um, and you'll see why it is called two-finger compaction. And it, these algorithms have different uh, advantages and disadvantages. But first, I want to talk about the disadvantages of two-finger compaction. Unfortunately, uh, two-finger compaction it is, is slow. <laughs> this is not a good attribute. Uh, the, other, the other attribute is that it moves objects to random places in memory. Uh, and we should talk about this disadvantage tonight over beers, uh, or not beers if you don't drink. Uh, just we should talk about it. This is bad compared to other bad compared to other object or other compaction algorithms because they don't move them to random places. Now this algorithm does have one extremely good advantage, and that advantage is that um, it is easy. <laughs> This is the thing that drew me to this algorithm. I like easy things. <laughs> so that is why I chose this one. So the algorithm has essentially two main parts. We can divide it into two parts. With one is uh, object movement, and the other is reference updating. So object movement, essentially what we do is we say, OK, uh, we have a bunch of objects here, and we're going to move them around. And I'm going to describe to you exactly how this algorithm works. Basically, what we do is we take two fingers and point them at either side of the heap. So imagine that this is our, this is our heap in memory. We have some free spaces and some objects that are, that are in memory. So we point at either side of the heap. We have one pointer that we call a free pointer, and then we have another pointer we call a scan pointer. And this is why we call it two-finger compaction, because we're pointing at either side. Now, the free pointer moves to the right until it finds a free space. And the scan pointer moves to the left until it finds something that's filled. In this case, they don't have to move because where they started, the free pointer started on a free space, and the scan pointer started on a filled space. So they don't need to move. Now, what they do is, when they, f when they stop, they swap those two spaces, like so. So we swap the object over to the free space and the free space back over. And then we leave a forwarding address in the previous one. So this object that was in B is now in slot 1. So we're going to leave a forwarding address of 1 there. So we know that whatever was in B, whatever used to be in B, is now in slot 1. Then we repeat. Scan free pointer moving to the left, scan pointer moving to the right. Then they swap, leave a forwarding address. And we repeat this process until the two fingers meet. Yes, animations. Yes. So they met, and they're done. So we've compacted this, all of the free spaces in one side and the objects are on the other. The next step is reference updating. So imagine that we have this bit of Ruby code here at the bottom, some hash table. The hash table points at a uh, symbol and a string. And maybe it's laid out in memory like this, where the hash table's at 4, and the symbol and string are at 6 and 7. Now, after we've compacted the, he the heap, it may look something like this where uh, the string is now at position 3, and the symbol is now at position 5. But the hash points at these old locations. So we have to update these arrows to point at the correct location. And the way that we do that is fairly simple. We just start out on one side. We look at the object. We say, hey, object, do you have any references? If so, we look at the references and see if they point to a forwarding address. If they do, we update the address. So, and then we move to the next object. So those ones don't have pointers. This one does. So we update it to now point at change from 6 and 7 to 5 and 3, like that. And now it points at the right locations again. And we continue moving along the heap until we've exhausted all the objects. And we're done. 
So we've updated, we've updated all the references. Then the very last step is we change these forwarding addresses to free slots again, like that, and we're done. We've compacted the heap, all of the objects are in one place, all the free space is in another, and we've completed this, completed this process. So the next thing I want to look at is actual implementation details. So I want to walk through the actual code used to implement this. And you can find the code here up on uh, GitHub. <laughs> <laughs> Shameless plug. <laughs> at, this, at this address, if you go there, you can check out the code. Uh, what this code does is it introduces a new method called gc.compact. So this, this method allows you to manually compact the objects in your heap. And the way that we use it at work is we say, okay, well, we have a bit of code like this. We're going to load. This is just pseudocode. We say, okay, uh, load all of Rails and its dependencies. So we load all of Rails and its dependencies here. Uh, we load all of our application code. Uh, then we compact the heap, and then we GC or then we call uh, fork for all of the. Oh, go back. Then we call fork for all of the child processes, all the unicorn processes. So this isn't what it actually looks like in our code base, but we've hooked into unicorn to do the uh, GC steps, the compaction at the right place. So let's look at the actual changes to GC.C. Uh, all the, since this is all to do with the garbage collector and gc.c contains all of the uh, gc code, that's where most of my changes had to be. So I introduced a new function called gc move, and all this function does is swap the two locations, swap two locations and set a forwarding address. So it takes two, adre two uh, objects and swaps the two. The next thing that I had to do is introduce a new type of object called t moved. Uh, the T moved, T moved object is hidden to normal Ruby developers. It's an internal, internal only object. And all this T moved does, T moved is right here, that is a T moved. All it does is indicate that this is a forwarding address. It's a way for when you're scanning the, scanning the Ruby memory to say, hey, oh, this is a forwarding address. I know that I need to change and move it. Uh, the other function that I introduced is a new one called GC compact heap. And all this function does is move the pointers left and right. So GC compact heap moves the pointers and then calls GC move. Uh, those are the two main functions that actually do the compaction step. The next step is a function I introduced called GC update object references. And it does exactly what it says. It just says, OK, if we have these, this object sitting at 1 and it pointed at a 1, we need to change, we need to update the address. That should say 2. That is a typo but it should point at two now. Now this function actually has to call out to a bunch of different functions, reference update helpers, because the way that we update references is different for arrays or for objects or hashes or any type of object that you might create in Ruby, we have to, uh, the way that we actually update those references is different. The way we find and update references is different. Now I had to introduce one other thing, and this is a sad thing, and we're gonna talk about why it's sad. Uh, this is a thing called pinned bits. Uh, this, is a, this is a table called pin bits. And what this does is it says, okay, um, this object cannot move. In certain cases, there are objects that can't be moved, and we need to be able to indicate that somehow. And we, I do that with a table called pin bits. So the question is, you know, this is, a, this is a limitation of the compaction, is that some objects can and can't move. But, okay, let's, up to now, let's talk about, let's make a list. I want to make a list of objects that can move. So far, in this algorithm that we've discussed, Everything can move. So we have our list here. This is good. It's great. Every object in our, in our system can move. Now we have a problem here. There's a challenge with compaction is that we need to be able to find references. So I need to be able to look at an object and say, OK, uh, what other objects does this object reference? Because I need to update those references. Now this is really easy for a pure Ruby, pure Ruby references. So here's an example of a Ruby object that it's a pure Ruby object, just regular Ruby object. And uh, if we look at an object graph, we can see that we have an instance of foo and it points at an instance of bar and it does that via uh, an instance variable called at bar. And both of these objects are implemented in Ruby. Ruby itself implements these, these objects. It knows the internals of these objects. And because it knows the internals of these objects, it's easy for me as a GC developer to say, OK, I'm going to find all the references. Because I know how those internals are implemented. Uh, and you should too, after the awesome talk today <laughs> about classes. So you should know this too. OK. 
Uh, since, we know, since we know the internals, it's easy for us to update. Now, this is, this is good. This is our best case scenario. Unfortunately, we have a, another issue, which is C references. Now, imagine that we have this class, class bar. Class bar is our regular Ruby object. But we have this, this other class called foo. Now, let's say this foo class is implemented in C. Okay? And it points at, it points at bar. Now, unfortunately, we don't know how this arrow is made. How, how does foo point at bar? We don't know how it actually does that. Well, the GC doesn't. I don't know how your C code is written. I can't inspect it. Because I can't inspect it, I don't know how that reference is made. Now, um, let's say that bar gets garbage collected someday. If bar is garbage collected, goes away, and it means that that reference is now bad. So if your foo object tries to, tries to access bar, it's going to crash because the GC collected bar. So how do we solve this problem today? If you're writing a C extension to Ruby, you need to do something to prevent that object from going away. And the thing that you have to do is you have to call a function called rbgc mark. So you have to manually mark this object and say, hey, I'm holding a reference to this. Okay? You say, I hold a reference to this object. Please do not garbage collect this object. I need it. It's important to me. So now, Unfortunately, if I move that object off to the side and I place a T moved inside of that, your program will crash again. It'll try to access that T moved. It'll blow up. Right? So we can't move that. I can't move that object. I can't move it. So, but I need a way to be able to detect that I cannot move that arrow. I can't move that arrow. So the way that I decided to do this is to change RBGC marks such that it pins your object. It says, okay, um, there's a C object that's pointing at this Ruby object and I cannot move it. So I changed the RBGC mark function to put a mark for bar inside this pinned bits table and say, hey, we can't move this. Sorry, it's going to stay right here so that the C, the C object works OK. So I changed the implementation of RBGC mark to do two things. One is to mark the object, and the other is to put a pin bit in the pin bits table. So now uh, our GC compact function, what it does is it says, OK, we're going to do a full GC so all objects get pinned. Uh, we compact all the objects, and then we update the references. So those are the three steps of this compaction method. OK, so let's look at our list again. What well, can we move? Uh, everything except objects marked with RBGC mark. So let's look at other, let's look at other problems. Um, so far, everything has been fine in my journey to build this compaction. Everything was easy until I had to implement it. <laughs> so I want to talk about other objects that can't move. These are, program these are problems I encountered while developing this. So first, let's look at hash tables. Uh, now, most of us know how hashing works. We calculate a hash key for our object, and we stick that into the hash. Now, unfortunately, the default implementation of a hash key is the actual memory address of the object. So if I change the location of that object, it means that its address changes, and that means that the key changes, and that means that you won't be able to look up your object in the hash anymore, and that would be bad. You probably want to look up your objects in hashes, I think. Uh, if you can't find it, you might have a bad day. So I don't allow those to move. Those cannot move because they're based off the memory address. So that's another thing that goes in our pin bit table. The way that we can fix this is we can actually cache our hash key. I just haven't done this yet. We can say, OK, well, someone inserted this into the hash. Let's cache the hash key and never change it. Uh, I just haven't implemented this yet. So let's go back to our list of what can move. Uh, everything except objects marked with RBGC mark and hash keys. Okay, it's okay, just two things. Um, now let's look at dual references. This is another problem I ran into. Let's say we have two objects, uh, foo, which is written in C, and baz, which is written in Ruby, and they both point at bar. So one is a C object, one is a Ruby object. However, the author of the C object doesn't call RBGC mark. They decide not to call RBGC mark. And the reason behind that is because Baz points at bar, and they know that the object won't move. It stays in the same location. So they say, well, the other Ruby object is going to mark it, so I'm not going to bother marking it, because the other Ruby object keeps it alive. However, with a compacting garbage collector, OK, so it doesn't move. However, with a compacting garbage collector, it may move. I may move that. 
And we end up with a T moved, a T moved location in that same place. And what happens in this case is we say, okay, well, the compactor says, well, okay, Baz used to point at T moved, so we're going to update the address. It gets updated to, updated to the right location. But since the GC didn't know about the C implementation, it won't get updated and the program will crash. So the fix for this particular case is to change the code to call RBGC mark or only use Ruby objects. Don't use a C object anymore. And I ran into this problem with the message pack gem. If you go to that pull request, you can actually see, you can see the example where I fixed this message pack gem. And the example turned out to be, well, you didn't actually need to use C in the first place. We could use Ruby. So change it to use Ruby. So what can move? Everything except objects marked with RBGC mark and hash keys and dual reference objects. Okay, three things. <laughs> let's, look at, let's look at something else. So global variables. We'll look at global variables. So this is a, global variables, and when I'm talking about global variables, I mean in C. So for example, here we have the C code, and what it does is it creates a new class called foo, and it assigns that class to a C global. Now unfortunately, the garbage collector knows nothing about your C globals. So it doesn't know that you have a C global object pointing at this class. So the, C, the GC can't update these globals. So in this case, what I decide to do is use heuristics to pin these objects. I know that it's common for people to call RB defined class and assign that to a global. So use heuristics to pin those objects. Say, all right, if you create a class, that can't move. Those can't move. OK, so what can move? Uh, everything except objects marked with RBGC mark and hash keys and dual reference objects <laughs> and objects created with RB defined class. Okay, so what's next? String, liter string literals. <laughs> so let's say we have a string literal. For example, we have this foo and we just say puts hello world. Now, uh, when your Ruby code gets compiled, it's turned into what's called an I sequence object. This I sequence object, it's a Ruby object, but it's written in C. Uh, this I sequence object points at a list of literals. So it has a Ruby array of literals, and that literal points at, an, is, that literal points at the hello world, the string hello world. The actual bytecode, the instruction sequence also points at the bytecode. The bytecode is written in C, and the bytecode points at that string as well. So if the literal moves, that means that the bytecode needs to be updated as well. So we need to know how to go through and update bytecode. So we cannot move that because it is very difficult to change the bytecode. Updating bytecode is hard. So I haven't done that yet. It means that literals cannot move. It's possible, but I haven't written it yet. So what can move? OK, everything except objects marked with RBGC mark and hash keys and dual reference objects and objects created with RB defined class and string literals. <laughs> so if you're looking at this and you're saying, wow, geez, it seems like, it seems like nothing can move. <laughs> well, the good news, the good news for you and for me is that most of these things can be fixed. So I went through a list of all of these things that cannot move and when you think about all of them and their problems, uh, they can all be overcome. We can overcome all of them except for the RBGC mark case. We cannot fix that. The rest of these have fixes. So the real question is, how long does it take to do it? Uh, and I need to be able to actually type out the code that fixes them. So even with these restrictions that we have today with this initial implementation, if I run this against a test Rails application, in fact, 46% of the objects in the system can move. So even with these massive restrictions that we've applied, 46% of our heap can still move, and that's actually really great. So if we take a look at a graph, let's, let's look at a graph before we do compaction. This is a graph of the heap. Uh, the vertical lines are pages of the heap. Uh, the red lines are the number of objects in that page that cannot move, and the green lines are objects on that page that can move, and the white in the lines is free space. And these pages are sorted by number of objects that cannot move. This is before compaction. If we compact it, you can see that all of those objects, the green objects, move together. So they get grouped together. And we have those pages on the right. Now, let's look at some inspecting memory. I want to talk a little bit about inspecting memory. And the reason I want to talk about this is because if you're working on GC, if you're developing a garbage collector, you need to be able to inspect memory and analyze it. Otherwise, how do you know how much improvements you've done? 
Now, there's my favorite, my favorite way to inspect memory with Ruby is a uh, method called object space dump all, and you can use this in your applications today. So I want you to take a look at this function. It's the easiest and fastest way to understand your Ruby object's memory, the way that, or your Ruby program's memory. The way that you use it is you just call dump all, and it outputs a JSON. So I, in this case, I output uh, I open a file out.json and I write all of it out to that JSON file. Uh, and if you want to use this, please do what I am doing here, this file.open. Copy this code, please. Uh, the reason you want to do it is because other forms of it may close the file. or Your program, I've run into problems where your program exits without closing the file late enough and you'll end up with half written JSON. So do this, please. Um, if we take this, we can actually measure uh, the size of our heap when we boot Rails. So here's an example where I'm booting Rails in production. Uh, I do GC compact, and then I output this JSON, and I can see what the output looks after it looks like, or your heap looks like after we've compacted and booted the process. So the output looks something like this. This is just the JSON. Each line in your JSON file is one object. Uh, this is the same JSON I've just formatted it so it looks nice. But what's interesting about this is uh, you'll see the address of the object. That's the actual address of the object in memory. It's location in your computer's memory. Uh, and it lists all the objects that that object references. So if you look through the JSON, you can build a tree of all the objects in your system. And it also lists the size of the objects, how much memory that object used. So you can figure out uh, what's consuming memory in your system. So remember, the address is the location. And if we know the location of the objects, we can actually calculate a, a graph of the heap. And this is what a graph of the heap looks like based off of those addresses. So if you look at this, you can see heap fragmentation. Before, we didn't really see it so much because all the objects were stacked together. This is a graph of the memory and where objects are actually located. So red dots represent. Uh, objects and white dots represent empty spaces. And this is before, before we do compaction. Now if we graph it again after compaction, you can see all of those get grouped together and we have one solid red square. I made a, another graph where you can see here um, red dots represent pinned objects and green dots represent ones that can actually move so you can get a sense of where all of the pinned objects are. And again, if we move it uh, like this, you can see all the red objects get moved together. Uh, and if you want to do something like this with your application today, you don't need the patches that I have against Ruby. You can use this with your Ruby implementation today. And if you go to this uh, URL again, <laughs> again on github.com, <laughs> I feel like a salesman, I'm sorry. <laughs> If you go to this URL, let's just say this URL, you can get, those, you can get access to those tools. So now, I, wanted, I talked a lot about uh, copy and write optimizations, and I want to talk about how to me measure those in production. So let's look at how to actually measure copy and write optimizations with your process. The way you do this on Linux, uh, I don't actually know how to do this on OS X yet. Um, the way you measure this on Linux is you use the proc file system, and you look for a thing called the SMAPS file. So you look at your PID, whatever PID you have for Unicorn or whatever process, and look up the SMAPS file. And if you look inside of it, it gives you descriptions of the layouts of the memory for that process. And you'll see a bunch of entries in it that look like this. And what this is is you'll see at the top here is the address range of those, the address range of those pages. Uh, and it also displays the RSS, the PSS, uh, and the shared dirty and shared clean. We'll talk about those in a second. So this address range is important because that address range matches up to those object addresses that we saw in the heap dumps. So if you look at your heap dumps versus the SMAP files, you can figure out exactly where those objects are mapped into your operating system's memory. Now, uh, the RSS and the PSS are pretty interesting. You've, I'm sure you've seen RSS if you run top. Uh, the RSS is essentially taking these values, the shared clean, shared dirty, private clean, and private dirty, and adding all of those up together. Okay. We'll talk about why this is important in a second. The PSS, what that does is it takes the shared dirty, the num divides that by the number of processes, and then adds up the shared clean, private clean, private dirty. Now, these are interesting numbers because uh, if we look at the RSS versus the PSS of, uh, say, your unicorn application or any, any process, um, you'll see that 
If we compare the two, say we have a unicorn parent process that's uh, three megabytes and a unicorn child process that's three megabytes, you might assume that the total amount of memory that they're using is seven megabytes, but it's not. It's actually the sum of the PSS. The total usage is actually three megabytes. This is just if we measure just after forking. And the reason is because the child process is sharing all of the memory of the parent. So our total usage is three megabytes, not seven, whether if you looked at the RSS. So we can take an example of this. Let's look an at an example of how these, these numbers change over time. So let's say we, we create a uh, program here where we fork a process and we gradually write to that process. And if we graph the RSS and the PSS, it'll look something like this over time. You'll see the RSS stays constant where the PSS and the shared dirty, PSS increases and the shared dirty decrease. So what we want to do is we want to optimize for having those, uh, the most number of shared dirty pages possible. So now, let's, now that we know how to measure copy and write optimizations, what we want to do is measure how this compaction impacts copy and write. So what we say is, in this particular case, we compact the heap fork a new process, then fill the rest of the heap and compare it, see what the, and see what the PSS looks like. Now, unfortunately, these are the numbers. <laughs> if we don't compact, the amount of memory it takes is about 2.6 megabytes. If we do compact, it's 2.5. So our total savings is 154 kilobytes. So we're still testing this in production. I need you to know that this is with a basic Rails app that doesn't actually load much code. Uh, we're still testing this in production with real load, so I'm not sure what a real application looks like, but it doesn't look so great after this development. So let's finish this up. The <laughs> compaction savings are unknown. The reason is because we're testing against a fake load. We don't know what this looks like in a real world situation currently. Also, only 46% of objects can move. Obviously, the higher we get this, the better, the, the better these numbers are gonna look. Uh, if you want to measure objects or measure memory usage in your application today, use this, use object space. Uh, if you want to measure copy on write optimizations, use the SMAPS files. Uh, again, I want, to end, I want to end this presentation by talking about why compact. And I mean, compaction, it's important for uh, improving copy on write and saving memory. But to me, the most important thing about this project was proving that it wasn't impossible. <laughs> Somebody asked me why, you know, why is, it, why is this impossible and I didn't have to answer, or I didn't have an answer, and I feel bad that I wasted so much time thinking, oh, this problem is impossible. I, I regret the time I, I kept thinking this is impossible. So what I want to say to people, to you today in the audience is, if you think something is impossible, like question your assumptions. Think about it. Why is this impossible? Have I tried it? Maybe I should try it. Maybe it's something I can do. Because in my experience, especially with computers, we're only limited by our imaginations, right? We can accomplish anything in, with these little magic boxes that we have in front of ourselves. So if you think something is impossible, just try it. See, maybe you can. So that is all. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I don't know if we have time for questions. Okay, we have time for questions. Yeah, we're gonna have some questions. Please question me yep. and my assumptions. Vlad, please. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can have a cat sticker. I will answer <laughs> that one already. Just come Thank say you, hello. Uh, I already have cat stickers. Hello, ah. them. <laughs> yes. Well, um, my question is, uh, what, of, what, what of those uh, problems is most restrictive? So what if we eliminate, for example, hash keys problem? Could we have 70% you know, compaction? Or the same question about another question, another problems. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, so I've got all the tools to map out like, okay, so one of, the, one of the open questions that I didn't talk about in this presentation is what is actually preventing all of those objects from moving? And I have all the tools to calculate that so I know I just don't remember the percentages off the top of my head, but the main targets are hash keys and um, literals in code. Okay, thank you. Very good question, next one. Nick. 
Um, sort of following up on that, are there built-in sort of heuristic behaviors of things that you can't move that allow you to say, well, I know that literals don't tend to change, so I can actually just stick them in a different place of memory, and then that curve that has red and green would really be two different sets of pages. Yes, that is an excellent question. Uh, so for anyone that didn't hear, the question is, are there heuristics about objects that we could say, at the time we allocate the object, is this thing unmovable? Uh, and then stick that in a separate location. Uh, and the answer is yes. I have actually done some other work on splitting heaps by type. And we do know, we can know heuristics about things. So for example, the, the example that I showed where we said, OK, um, classes, classes allocated with RB al RB defined class, those can't move. And we can know at allocation time that those can't move, and we'll, we can split it. So if we combine these two techniques of compaction plus heap splitting, we can actually improve a lot. So there are cases where we can move, and I just literally have not typed the code yet, like for example, hash keys. And there are cases where we cannot move, but we could allocate into a different location and improve this. So there are different techniques we can use to get to, you know, 90, 99% of objects, yes. All right, one more final question. Yep. Uh, I'm not sure if it is a stupid question or something. But uh, seems like, it seems like we are trading memory efficiency with like, computation efficiency, right? Because, I mean, in a world where we, if we have a lot of like, memory space, would compaction make any difference at all? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question, actually. Will, will compaction make any difference even though we're allocating tons of objects all the time? Uh, in this case, so in this case, yes. The idea is we take all of the, so let me back up a little bit. When you compile your Ruby code or when, when your Ruby code gets compiled, a lot of that is internally represented as Ruby objects. So um, classes, those string literals are actually represented as Ruby objects. You don't, you don't ever have access to those objects, but they're implemented internally as Ruby objects. So uh, what I can do is say, OK, after we've loaded all the code, since that code is going to live in memory for the life of your process, if we compact all of those together, then fork off processes later, all of that stuff that was initially allocated will stay, stay shared between all the processes. Today, the issue is, uh, if we take a look at, let me rewind, the, rewind this a little bit to here. Nope, there. Uh, so today, this is what your memory looks like. And anytime we allocate an object in one of the child processes, and it allocates into one of those uh, white holes, maybe some of the red stuff gets copied along with it to the child process, right? But if we compact it together like this, there's no holes in there for it to get copied. Because remember, the operating system copies more than just one object. It'll copy a whole page. So if we can make sure that there's no holes in there, then we don't have those extra, extra objects being copied to the child process. So as your code is running or as your Rails app is um, processing requests, maybe compaction isn't so useful because those objects are going to go away, um, which is actually why we wanted to do it right before we forked all the child processes. We want this for long-lived objects. Does that make sense? All right, thank you so much. Put your hands together one more time for Eric Patterson. Thank you. And please, please come say hello to me. This is my first time in Malaysia, and I don't know when I'll get to come back. So I would like to talk to all of you. We can say hello as a group right now. OK, one, two, three. Hello. Problem solved. <laughs> we compacted that hello. <laughs>